Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the BioAccel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov, and I will be today's host. Today, we will present you a very interesting talk on one high level framework for development of parallel applications, the uh, COMSES framework, and it will be presented to us by Daniel Letzi from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Barcelona Supercomputing Center is one of the main partners in BioXL, and they're working on uh, the development of uh, such uh, frameworks for parallel applications. So for those of you who are new to BioXL, I want to give a very brief overview. BioXL is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research, and we work in three main directions. One is the improvement of the performance, scalability, and efficiency of several key applications extensively used in biomolecular research. These are GROMAX for molecular dynamic simulations, typically used HADOC, which is used for integrative modeling and docking, and also CPMD for hybrid QMMM simulations, for example, of enzymatic systems. In addition to the main codes, we also work extensively on uh, the development of efficient uh, uh, workflows and packages associated with data integration, which uh, have the main aim of improving the productivity of researchers so that in a very easy and user-friendly way, one can bundle together different applications, tools, scripts, and easily submit them to uh, clusters for large-scale computations. And today's presentation is, in fact, uh, uh, on one of the uh, main results of the work in BioXL in this direction. Uh, Comsess is one of the main platforms, platforms that we work with. So in addition to working with the software and with the workflows, we also have a lot of effort on training, consultancy. We're promoters of best practices for usage of applications, for code development, and uh, we work a lot with end users from academia and industry. We organize the work along several interest groups, which we invite you to join. You can find more about it on our website and visit our discussion forums and browse to our code repositories and visit the chat channel. With that, I would like to present our today's speaker, Daniele Lezzi from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Daniele Lezzi has a PhD in IT technology engineering from the University of Salento in Italy. And until 2008, he's been a researcher at the Center for Advanced Computing Technologies at the University of Salento and member of the Euro Mediterranean Center for Climate Changes. And since, since 2008, he's been uh, working at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center as a researcher, researcher and his work focuses on high performance, distributed and cloud computing with the associated programming models, specifically focusing on interoperability. He has a very broad experience. He's been working uh, a lot of uh, European funded projects uh, of various size and uh, he's currently involved in the mobile folk to cloud project in the land support initiative and he's one of the main people in the working on workflows in BioXL, as I mentioned already. And you can find him on Twitter with uh, Lazy Dunn uh, Twitter handle. And with that, I'd like to, I will change now to Daniele to start with the main talk. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so in this uh, presentation, I will uh, introduce the COMS programming framework and uh, how we uh, use uh, in the BioXL uh, initiative. As, uh, I, I will do a very uh, short um, a demo of the workflows that we implemented in the BioXL uh, around uh, uh, molecular dynamics using our framework. So, uh, when we mm, uh, talk about uh, programming, uh, 
an, an application, uh, we have many, uh, many ch uh, challenges uh, that we have to face. The first is how, um, what, what is the, the magic that uh, we, uh, um, that we realize to face these uh, challenges? How we make uh, with comps, in this case, uh, things uh, uh, executed in, in a parallel, for example. First of all, the first challenge is uh, the heterogeneity of the variety of computational platforms we have to deal with uh, every day. So we have uh, new architectures, uh, that means organizational processors, how uh, processors are uh, uh, designed with uh, multi-cores, many cores, now we have a lot of uh, usage of GPUs and accelerators and uh, FPGAs. Um, so uh, this is a very important uh, uh, issue that we have to deal with because, of course, we have to run the, an application, which is supposed to be one uh, code, on different uh, backends with uh, heterogeneous uh, architectures. So the idea is um, when we talk about about high performance computer, when we think about uh, high performance computer, uh, we shift from the sequential uh, way of thinking the, uh, uh, the application uh, to parallel. So, um, another step that we have to introduce in our schema. Uh, so, using uh, possibly new instruction sets, new languages, uh, SMPI, OpenP, etc. And uh, uh, we have everyday new uh, computing paradigms. We started with a cluster, then there was the idea of, of grid computing in the 90s. Then we have the, uh, the era, and we are also in now the era of the clouds. And uh, now a word that's missing in this slide is uh, containers, as you, as you may know. So different uh, challenges uh, related to different compu computational uh, platforms. So. Um, when we talk about programmability, uh, programmability is the capability of programming something, but we have to do in the in the proper way. We have to be good uh, programmers and uh, provide to our users uh, programming models that are e easy to, to be used uh, by the application developers that are able to provide expressivity uh, to the user in order to uh, program in, uh, in the proper way the, uh, the code and uh, reduce as much as possible the uh, lines of code. Of course, we need to provide semantics functions that is the life of the, uh, of the developers. Um, the, the main blocking factor when you talk in parallel is the fact that in a way we uh, are sequential. So we may think that something can be done in parallel, but still we uh, think about communications in uh, in a sequential uh, way. Um, uh, so, um, in the end, when we work with our users uh, that comes from the scientific uh, communities, uh, communities uh, they are uh, used to uh, work with the programming languages that are thought to be uh, used uh, to execute sequential uh, applications. So, um, and when we shift to, to, to parallel programming, uh, one of the first uh, things that we have to um, change is the fact that the user uh, on his own has to express the parallelism, has to think about how to distribute the data in order to enable this parallelization and uh, to uh, also synchronize and uh, perform the communications typical in MPI, um, for example. Um, so, with um, the things are getting also more complicated when we uh, want to distribute uh, the application on distributed and uh, environment. As we said before, uh, we um, have multi cores. So, when we distribute things, we are in many cases uh, using a heterogeneous infrastructure, as I said before. So, we have uh, one cluster that can, can have multi core, another one that can have uh, just GPUs. Uh, we have to distribute across multiple uh, nodes uh, the, the part of the application that we want to parallelize. And we have also we have to deal with the, with the memory that in this case is uh, distributed. And uh, above all, we have a lot uh, of uh, middlewares to manage uh, the, the resources. Uh, we can have uh, from uh, HPC, 
queue managers to cloud managers, uh, for example, Amazon, Google, they provide their own management system. And uh, now we have, as I said, uh, containers um, uh, technologies. So um, with all uh, these uh, problems uh, in, uh, in mind, related to the programming of application and distributed system, uh, we have our vision, uh, here you see uh, since many years, on how to um, develop programming frameworks uh, that can, uh, let's say, abstract these difficulties to the final user, let's say, to the uh, applications. So the idea is that the programming model uh, should uh, enable applications to be agnostic of the computing platform. The idea is that this programming uh, model layer should be high level, as clean as, as possible, and abstract uh, okay, to write the applications. And on the other side, having a powerful uh, runtime that can perform the optimization, parallelization techniques on those uh, applications, and that will take care of all the intricacies of using the uh, underlying technologies, for example, to uh, execute the same application on the clusters, on um, uh, grids and, uh, and clouds, etc. Um, so, in uh, with um, comms, uh, you know, comms mean comms superscalar. Uh, so, what is a, a superscalar uh, programming model? The, the deal of the superscalar programming model comes from the superscalar uh, processors. Uh, where mm, the idea of the superscalar processor model is that we have a task that is a unit of work, and these tasks are executed in out of order uh, when there are no dependencies uh, related to, to each task. And um, so the same idea from this uh, coming from this uh, superscalar processor is being adapted to the programming model. So the idea is that the applications are built programmed in a way that um, the runtime of the programming framework uh, is able to build a task graph that express the potential concurrencies between uh, the invocation of the, of the tasks. And um, so this runtime is able to uh, make decisions uh, on when and how uh, and where to execute a, a task. And, um, offers uh, abstractions to different uh, backends uh, related to, for example, computing and storage. So this means that a user can write the, can program the application and uh, can also um, uh, configure the runtime in order to execute the same uh, application as an important feature of our programming framework on a, a quite uh, large variety of computing infrastructures without changing the the code uh, itself. So um, the, the main uh, elements of this uh, programming uh, model, of superscalar programming model, are the superscalar program that is uh, made of the sequential code of the user. So the user doesn't have to uh, parallelize the code. So we don't have to uh, we are not introducing here a programming language SMPI where the user has to write from scratch, in many cases, the application in order to be properly um, uh, parallelized. Uh, so the, the application is sequential. We have a single, uh, we have a shared memory space, and uh, we have to identify the task. I will show you in, in, uh, shortly how what this identification task uh, is performed. So the task is, uh, said before, the main element of the programming model is the computational unit. This could be, uh, for example, in an application, a function of a certain granularity uh, that operates on uh, some input parameters and variables and uh, produces uh, some uh, output. The, uh, the task um, can be, uh, as I said, it can have uh, different granularity. Granularity means the uh, amount of work that is performed inside the, uh, the task, so inside the module, the function. And um, depending on this granularity, actually, uh, we'll, uh, we have here, BSC, at least a different um, implementation of the programming uh, framework 
to deal with the different granularity uh, models. Um, uh, so uh, this task, when uh, executed, is important. Is execution is independent, at least the execution itself, from other tasks. The only dependencies that we have are data dependencies, but these are managed by the by the runtime. Related to the syntax, um, there is no uh, language. There is no API itself. What um, what we have are uh, task annotations. So the user has to identify the uh, components of this uh, application that are candidates to be uh, tasked to be uh, executed on a given node, on a given slot of the uh, available uh, computing infrastructure. As to provide a description of these uh, uh, functions, of this task, in terms of arguments, the, the type and directionality, and uh, eventually, in, provide also some uh, synchronization. Even though this is not um, uh, something very common, but we can provide uh, some call that allows the user, for example, to perform synchronization or between the calls to, to the task. So um, here at BSC, we have uh, two main implementations of this uh, um, idea of the uh, superscalar programming model, which uh, also is called a task-based programming model. Uh, so we uh, call this the idea a star superscalar, star meaning uh, whatever superscalar, and then we have two uh, main uh, implementation. We have the OMS implementation, then we have the COMS by COMS. We use the term COMS by COMS, um, we mix a bit the definitions. Uh, we started uh, with COMS, but then with the advent of uh, Python, uh, we at the right so we interest on this kind of on this, this language we also adapted the, the name to uh, the so the difference mainly is the we have the same idea of the task as a basic unit of work but we address a um, uh, different kind of application we don't we work at um, for example, in a, in a cluster at a level of a node. So we have shared memory uh, uh, architectures, uh, we have GPUs, so we are in a cluster. And uh, above all, the granularity of the task is uh, quite small. We are talking about microseconds, milliseconds. While on the other side with comps, we deal with uh, um, uh, more um, post-grained uh, granularity where uh, tasks are composed of methods uh, maybe programs, simulation that can run from a few milliseconds uh, to days in many cases. And um, in the case of OMS, the idea is that everything executed in, in memory, so the dependencies are uh, in memory. While in COMS, we deal with the distribution of files, we serialize uh, parameters as objects. And um, it was related with the, uh, the language uh, support uh, with uh, OMS, uh, users can write application in C, C++, and Fortran. While with COMS, um, uh, we have Java, which is the native um, language uh, of the COMS runtime. And then we have also can have um, application written in C, C++, and uh, Python. So as you can see here, we uh, we go from a pure uh, cluster computation uh, to a distributed computation with comms with clusters because for to us a cluster also is a distributed environment because we consider each node of a cluster as a separate entity let's say as a separate uh, slot where to execute tasks with clouds uh, grids etc so um, programming with uh, with comps again the idea is that the code is uh, still uh, sequential so the user um, has his uh, sequential uh, code sequential application and um, what we do is to annotate this code to then to identify the tasks and the directionality of the, of the data directionality means that for example if i have an integer uh, in, the, in a call of a task, uh, of a method, of a function, 
the user has to say that this integer is an input to the task, or is can be an output, or can be also input output. Um, based on this information, on the uh, what is to be executed in the house, or what are the parameters of the application, the runtime builds a task class that express the potential concurrency uh, so of the uh, execution of that uh, application. Um, this is the basic idea. This is important to understand the concept. The basic idea is that uh, we don't do any, any magic, let's say, as I said in the first slide. Uh, but what we do is we try to um, uh, exploit the potential uh, or the implicit uh, parallelism that uh, we have in a many application. You can, for example, consider um, a typical uh, part of a code, which is a for loop. And in a for loop, we call several times, depending on the number of iterations. So we call the same uh, code many times, but maybe but with different uh, parameters. So depending on the type of parameter and on the directionality of this parameter, each call can be independent of the other. Um, so, for example, if you see this uh, example uh, graph here, you can see that uh, in this case, we have the green uh, ballets at the, the beginning uh, that are independent uh, one of, of, of the other. The only dependence is the input that they receive from the main program, okay? Uh, but this means that uh, depending on the number of nodes that I have, I can execute all these tasks in parallel on the available uh, nodes. Um, so this is the, the basic idea of comps expressing the potential concurrency of the execution uh, of the task. So there is no um, identification of the parallelism inside the code, explicit uh, parallelism inside uh, of the code. And uh, of course, the other important feature is the fact that this code that we annotate is agnostic of the computing uh, platform. It's the runtime that enables the interoperability with different um, backends, cluster clouds, uh, Docker containers, etc. Um, so uh, in the case of PyCom, so the Python is an example you can see here uh, that you have uh, a regular uh, Python code with no parallelism anywhere. And we use decorators to uh, identify the, uh, the task inside the Python. In, in COMS, in general, we have two kinds of uh, annotations. The task annotation to identify the COMS task and the are optional uh, annotations, but are very important because can drive the, uh, or can force the uh, scheduling of the runtime. This is because from what side we have the definition of the application uh, here in the, in the programming uh, model, and the user can specify, for example, the number of uh, uh, processors needed to execute uh, that specific uh, function, independently of the uh, actual uh, uh, infrastructure. On the other side, as we will see later, uh, comes as a description of the real platform where the, uh, the application is going to be executed. Based on this description of the uh, resources and the description here of the uh, application, um, uh, the runtime matches those requirements and decides uh, where to execute the, uh, the task. Um, as I said before, we don't have any API, but we can have, we have some uh, small, uh, very few API uh, internals to, for example, synchronize uh, the uh, execution. This is, for example, used in, uh, in Python uh, to uh, synchronize uh, future uh, objects as a result of the execution of a, of a, of a task. In general, the, the comms wait on is used to, to block the execution uh, of a, an application um, until all the tasks of, 
of the part of graph are uh, executed successfully. Um, mm, so this is an example of Python. In Java, uh, because of the different uh, features of the of the languages, we have a separate file that we call uh, annotated interface. So it's an itf.java file that comes with uh, the Java uh, file, uh, where uh, we do the same uh, as in the, in the Python case. Really, things that is expressed in a separate file and using a Java annotated interface. So, for example, in this case, we have the uh, align uh, function in Java that takes several uh, parameters. Uh, all, all but one are input uh, parameters, and there is just one out, which is the result of this align uh, method. And we have the uh, uh, the part that specifies the uh, constraints. And here we can find another um, annotation in comps, which is the binary uh, annotation. All the, um, I'm not going to show all the uh, possible annotations in this presentation, but of course you can have a detailed description on our uh, um, documentation. The binary is, uh, uh, binary uh, annotation is very useful because allows for the execution of an existing uh, binary uh, binary uh, that implements the uh, specific task. Um, this is very common. Uh, in, we deal with many of these cases because, in many, as I said before, in our um, experience, uh, we um, have uh, collaborations with uh, scientific users that already have uh, applications. Uh, also here in the Excel, in the end, we or less we do the same. So the idea through this binary annotation is to provide support uh, to an existing binary in a more clean and uh, easy, easy way. Um, so in Java, you can have a part of the description of the task also where the uh, the method is implemented, which class Java class the method is implemented. And uh, as you can see here, um, this lower part in the main code, uh, this function is called uh, as it is. You can see here there is no actually uh, there is no comps here. There is no specific language here. So this could be uh, considered as the sequential code. This is sequential code of the user that if you execute in a sequential way, uh, it will be the same as executed in comps. The only difference is that comps uses this description to parallelize where possible, respecting, of course, the sequential integrity. We parallelize the execution of these assembly uh, partition uh, tasks in a proper way. Um, so from the point of view of the user, the execution is exactly the same as without comps. The only difference is that with comps, the code is like executed immediately. This is because uh, comps, as I said before, uh, uh, intercepts somehow the calls to the user uh, methods and substitutes these calls to invocation to task it in a, in a remote node of a cloud or a grid, for example, or, or, or a cluster. But the execution, the, uh, we keep, of course, the sequential integrity and coherency or uh, coherence of the of the original sequential code. Um, so um, this is a brief introduction to the programming model. As you can see, it's quite uh, easy. Again, the complete description of the programming model is available on the forms um, uh, documentation. So uh, talking about where we can execute uh, comps applications. Um, so our architecture is uh, uh, simple in the sense that we have a programming uh, model part, as we have described so far, where we have the support for Java, Python, C, C++ uh, application. And then we have a, a runtime, uh, which is transparent to, to, to the user. Transparent uh, in the sense that the user doesn't have to know, of course, the, the runtime details, but has to configure uh, some file in order to tell comps where to execute things. And we support a, mm, quite a lot of uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have support for uh, mm, uh, clusters 
here when we say cluster, we mean a um, queue management system. For example, here we see with Marinos, we that is uh, works with the Slurm. So we have an adapter for the Slurm. This means that the user can enqueue uh, an entire comms application in a, in a cluster, and the comms uh, it comms deals with the allocation of resources of nodes and etc. Uh, we have supported to, to clouds. We have worked a lot in the last years uh, with clouds. Um, we have interoperability with uh, many uh, providers, uh, as for example, Open Nebula backends, Open Stack, um, Amazon, uh, Google. Uh, we have a, a, a connector. We have connectable connectors. The part of the runtime that can be configured for different backends. We have a connector with J clouds that are. Uh, gives us interoperability with many uh, different backends also for example Microsoft Azure and uh, comms is also able to talk with docker so we have a, we have a, a comms docker image and this mm, docker image can be in general a, a docker an application that is um, packaged as a container can be executed with uh, with the comms and for example one uh, other uh, other backend that we are talking about with is uh, Mesos mm, that you may know is a is a quite big uh, uh, management uh, source management system mm, for containerized platforms and um, as, so once uh, once we know that we have this interoperability how uh, I can select the execution platform so it's quite easy. Um, just as a brief introduction to the runtime uh, details, uh, the comms runtime is made up of different uh, small components. And um, uh, what the user has to, has to do uh, for executing, uh, we have sorry, we have components for uh, uh, the generation of the graph. So the uh, this task analyzer uh, is the uh, is the component that is responsible for the generation of the task graph that is used then to uh, exploit the parallelism of the invocation of the of the task. Uh, we have the scheduler that, based on different pluggable scheduling policies, decides uh, how to execute the task and uh, where. And we have then um, different plugins uh, for resource management, as I said before, so for different resource providers. There's this for clouds, for containers, and also for yes, so we have support for different um, uh, persisting objects uh, protocol and communication uh, protocols. This can all be configured in uh, depending on the user uh, needs. So the configuration of the uh, of comms uh, for the execution of a specific infrastructure is done in these uh, resources. Um, uh, component providing uh, two uh, simple files. Uh, we have uh, the description of the all the resources that are available for this uh, uh, execution. This means that here the user can describe, for example, in the case of a uh, of a cluster or of a cloud, uh, how the nodes are made of, for example, how many processors each node, the memory, the um, the size of the of the disk, uh, etc. And then can configure through another file, the project file, how to access uh, those nodes. For example, the project, the user usually provides details on how to connect to, um, to Amazon Cloud. So in the project, user can provide the, the key, the secret to, to connect to Amazon, etc. So through the proper configuration of these two files, the, the same application, again, I want to highlight the fact that the same application can be executed executed on different uh, backends. Uh, also, we have a lot of tests where we, uh, where the user can execute the same application on, on an heterogeneous set of resources. A typical test that we uh, do in cloud is to start the application in a cluster, but then comes is also uh, configured to be able to use a cloud uh, as a backend where no more resources are available in the in the cluster is a typical uh, case. So we have hybrid execution of comms. There is no limitation in this sense. Um, 
uh, so this part of the connectors is responsible for the static. And uh, about clouds is very uh, very powerful how we implemented the cloud support because we enable uh, elasticity uh, for the user. As you know, uh, with clouds, there is this idea of virtual uh, resources that can be created and destroyed on demand. In this case, it is the comps runtime uh, based on the actual load of the uh, of the application. So based on what is currently ready for execution in the task graph, comps can ask for more uh, virtual machines to a provider way to execute the, the task. And uh, so you can, uh, for example, a big part of your application that requires a lot of task execution. In this case, comps uh, understands, detects this, uh, Necessity and uh, ask for more virtual machines to a provider. Once this peak is uh, it's over, the resources can mm, are automatically destroyed uh, on behalf of the of the, of the users. Um, so uh, the application usually, uh, as you can see here, are uh, executed to a simple uh, script command, which is the the run comps command. And depending on uh, what to execute, we have different. Um, uh, option that can be provided to the uh, comps uh, uh, script. Again, all the details are provided in the documentation. Um, so maybe I can skip a bit this part uh, to make the demo in the end. So we can have uh, you can have different configuration of comps. You can execute your own uh, local resources in an in interactive way. Interactive means that you run the the master. We call the master the part of the application. That main part uh, that is um, uh, analyzed by the run and that generates the tasks that are executed on the distributed uh, nodes. Uh, distributing the nodes means that the task code is sent to two workers, we call the workers part of the uh, of comps uh, runtime that takes as input the, the task itself and executes the, the code on the on the remote uh, resources and sends back the results to, to the runtime. So this is uh, the most uh, the most simple way of executing comps, for example, on our laptops for testing. And then we can have, as I said, in, uh, in the cluster, we usually connect to a login node. And instead of using, for example, uh, uh, run comps, we use NQ comps. In this case, the application, the resources are not provided by the users because we have an automatic uh, description of the resources. Uh, because as I said before, uh, comps is able to talk in, in my nostrum, for example, with the Sloom. So in this case, it's the runtime that uh, allocates the resources on behalf of the users and knows uh, when the uh, reservation is ready and in this case takes care of uh, use the pool of uh, resources that are being granted. In the cloud, uh, in the cloud, we have to configure the specific uh, uh, connector, cloud connector, to being able to talk with the, the provider API. So, in the case of uh, OCCI, and that is one a public standard that's used, for example, in the European Data Infrastructure Federated Cloud, the user has to provide the uh, the credentials to access the the providers and uh, instantiate virtual machines. Uh, in these slides where you have access, for example, uh, we have a, a video uh, where we use the Google uh, Cloud uh, platform. So if you have time, you want to, to see it, we have our channel and you can see a demo of a comps application executed on uh, in the Google Cloud. In Docker, uh, said before, we use Docker Compose to uh, describe uh, applications, uh, to deploy application, a uh, set of Docker uh, containers. Um, you know, in Docker, you can have different possibility. Um, one option is to use a Swarm. Uh, Docker Swarm is a way to uh, build and deploy um, a Docker cluster. Uh, so once you have this Swarm uh, cluster configured, you can execute uh, a comps application as a set of Docker uh, containers. Uh, in HPC, uh, given the uh, constraints, the requirements that we have on the use, uh, usage of containers, we can use Singularity. For example, we did um, 
several tests uh, with the comms in my nostrum using singularity on a small set of nodes. Um, actually, containers, as I'll show you after, is uh, something that we are doing, we are working a lot with. So, containers is the state of the art for the distribution of application. It's quite easy and it's for us. It's very, very powerful. So that's why we are working a lot also in the content by those platforms. Uh, something we also, which is very um, uh, actual is how we deal uh, with the convergence uh, with the comps with, with the convergence between HPC and the analytics. So we have uh, the objective to uh, provide a programming methodology to uh, develop complex workflows where we have a large simulation, uh, for example, uh, applications that are made of MPI uh, simulations that can run in a, uh, in a supercomputer together with the uh, uh, data analytics uh, parts. So it's what we call dynamic workflows. Uh, so we have a high level part that, that uh, calculates data analytics uh, models. And based on that, we can then instantiate an MPI execution on a supercomputer. Uh, so we're working a lot uh, with this. It's our ambition now. We are going to, to combine these two, uh, two worlds. HPC and the analytic uh, world. And uh, we are working a lot both on the programming side, of course, in order to provide the abstraction to the user, for example, to program with comps uh, streams and uh, for the analytics. And on the other side, we are also dealing, we're working a lot on the different storage backends uh, that uh, are uh, today available, for example, HDFS or uh, Redis. Uh, or other um, technologies uh, developed in house here, DSPS, data play for uh, persistency, etc. Um, and also something very uh, powerful now, we are working on kind of storage, as you may know, MVN memories, and sort of intermediate layer for storage between the disk and, uh, and the RAM with the persistency, something that we are working on. And this slide also too, um, because uh, when we uh, talk about comms, we say it's very powerful, we have a lot of users, etc. But many times we have the, um, the question, okay, uh, but what about Spark? Because Spark now is sort of uh, the facto standard when we talk about big data analytics, etc. So um, uh, we did, of course, our comparison in the last years with uh, with Spark. Uh, we improved a lot our performance and also the uh, expressiveness of our programming language. The architecture can be uh, can be compared. Actually, uh, we uh, have the the core, the programming model of Combs as as the Spark core, and on top of Combs, we uh, have developed a lot of linear algebra. Uh, modules, algorithms, parallelized with the comms. Uh, we also have examples of application developed with the tensor flows and executed with comms. And we are interoperable, as I said, with different computational and data infrastructure. We did, um, and uh, these results are published in papers, we did also comparison in Mare Nostrum of uh, similar uh, implementation of uh, data analytics uh, uh, blocks with both uh, comms and uh, and Spark, and in many cases, as you can see here, uh, we performed uh, we have performed uh, Spark. So uh, that's why I call we call this comparison David versus Goliath. Of course, we are small compared to Spark in the sense of the um, uh, distribution of the uh, and the usage of the of the tool, but uh, we think that we uh, are doing good work because the numbers are on our on our side many many times. So uh, these numbers many times. Um, what our uh, success stories? 
we have a lot of users uh, of comms. Uh, mainly, we uh, we develop comms, we enhance comms, we introduce new functionalities, of course, through the requirements that we receive by our users in in the project that we are uh, involved in. And but our strong, let's say, partners are uh, from BSC because BSC has internal uh, users uh, departments. One of these is the uh, Earth Science Department and the Life Science department life science department that are our mm, main uh, relations uh, this application the nmmb monarch is a uh, is, is a model the the nmmb is a model for dust uh, uh, prediction in uh, and is being developed by bsc in collaboration with the national centers for uh, with the NOAA in the states with, with nasa it's a very complex uh, application for um, climate uh, modeling. Uh, yeah, we have the detail, it's a multi-scale online endoscape atmospheric chemistry model, uh, where in the end uh, they model how the dust moves in the atmosphere, and based on these movements, they can predict the, the weather, how this dust, for example, coming from the Sahara in Europe, uh, affects the, um, the quality of the air in Barcelona or in, the, in Europe. And they, this code is a multi-scale in the sense that they can execute this simulation at different scales, from regional scale to uh, global scale. So this drives the amount of computation to be, to be per performed. And uh, talking about the, the requirements, this code uh, at the beginning was a combination of external binaries, CMK simulation, and uh, Python of code. There are a lot of different uh, modules that actually were, in many cases, um, uh, bash, uh, bash script. So what we did with them was to uh, implement a workflow, a complex uh, workflow uh, that from the programming uh, level uh, is easier to be read and to be composed, and that on the other side it runs uh, in, the, in a supercomputer in, in an optimized uh, way. Um, just as an example, we have we introduced the API, the, the, the native MPI support in comms based on this application requirement. So now uh, you can specify as uh, annotation your code as an MPI, in specifying, for example, how many compute nodes you need for this part of the uh, of the workflow, and how many computing units, in, how many threads, let's say how many processes inside each node. Based on this information, comes on behalf of the users and uh, allocates the proper number of, uh, of resources where to execute the MPI part of, of the workflow. This is the, so it's not clear, but because it's very complex, this is the task graph. This is what comps executes. So as you can say, it's quite complex. There are several iterations. There are parts that are MPI, other parts that are um, mm, non uh, MPI uh, uh, processes for the post processing, uh, et cetera. And there is the final image generation because in the end they produce maps of the movement of the dust uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. Um, so stepping in, uh, in BioExcel, um, Rosen already introduced uh, what, what we do in BioExcel. Um, as part of the work on uh, workflows, uh, we, um, uh, together with the uh, uh, IRB here at Barcelona, we uh, defined a set of uh, building blocks as base for the definition of uh, workflows, uh, for example, for the um, molecular dynamics uh, calculations. So the idea here was, uh, first of all, uh, have a, a rational implementation of the uh, task of the building blocks of an application in order to be interpretable, so reused in other implementation, infrastructure, infrastructure agnostic, and, um, and we uh, use uh, uh, PyComs to implement as workflow manager to uh, execute and orchestrate the execution of all these uh, building blocks. So you can see here on the right is the a sketch of the uh, of the workflow in terms of uh, building blocks. Um, and here uh, we did uh, many tests on different infrastructure during uh, by Excel, uh, from clouds to uh, Docker's um, 
and uh, supercomputers. Actually, now we are performing test, uh, large tests involving 40,000 goals in uh, my nostrum. We are uh, waiting for, uh, for the results. We are adjusting uh, things to have the uh, final picture. And uh, so COMS is dealing with this kind of uh, simulation where, where you have uh, the uh, massive protein mutation calculation. So this means that each of these uh, traits of this line uh, calculates a different mutation uh, of, the, uh, of the protein. Sorry, I'm not an expert of the, of the matter, so maybe I, I use wrong words. But anyway, from our side, what we do is uh, we uh, calculate, we distribute this uh, big uh, part of the application that comes from different proteins uh, implementation. Um, sorry, mutation. Uh, in the end, we have this kind of uh, uh, of graph. Uh, so you have a thread for each uh, mutation, and this is the the output, let's say, of the uh, of the execution of the of the workflow. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know if we have. Uh, how we are with the, in time, but my idea was to uh, maybe we, we cannot execute. So, as I said, we are working a lot with the containers. So, we have uh, a, a, a comms container, a Docker image. And uh, here, for example, we have a, an implementation with the Jupyter network of this PayMD setup. So, this molecular dynamics workflow that we implemented in BioExcel. And that we are going, when validated, we will also publish as a separate Docker container for distribution um, as a success story or story of BioExcel. Uh, so, here, what I wanted to show uh, is um, a bit how uh, the workflow is, is implemented. It's a, a quite a reduced uh, uh, version of the, of the workflow. So, um, but this is to show, first of all, that we, you can uh, work with uh, uh, notebooks with, uh, with Jupyter. This is a very uh, easy and a nice way of uh, testing and things. So, mm, with, uh, you can start a comps application as a Jupyter notebook using uh, PyComps as an uh, interactive uh, Python uh, module. Uh, here, as you can see, what we are doing is instantiating the uh, the runtime, so this is what we will do uh, usually from the command line with the run comps uh, command line. So here we're saying that we want to execute the PMD setup application. I have pre-configured uh, the, the, mm, the resource in the project files to use my uh, local resource on my laptop. So here we're saying, here we are going to use, uh, we are execute two mutations, each one on two cores of my, of my laptop. And here we are generating traces uh, because with comps you can have post mortem an analysis of the of the execution. Uh, you can have the bug, etc. So um, here we are instantiating interactively the, the, the runtime. Uh, sorry to okay. Here, as you can see, we defined a part of the application as task. We are using the task annotation for this survey. Uh, PC uh, function, which is a wrapper uh, on top of the of the Gromax uh, binary. Um, so here the the users they define the constraints, for example, uh, on this uh, task that uh, generates the the final results. We are defining a binary. Here, these building blocks are wrapped uh, around uh, uh, binary uh, files. So, using the binary annotation, the user can specify this uh, task that takes as input a file and generate uh, an output. And this is automatically done uh, by COM. So, we, here we say which is, which is the, the binary, the Gromax GMX uh, binary, and it's up to COMS to uh, run. The, the banner without doing any system kind of uh, calls directly on the user code. Uh, so here yeah, there is some problem with the, the notebook uh, to restart. There is some problem, but I don't know. Uh, 
I can show you directly maybe the, the results of this computation just to understand what happens. So here is, a, is the final result of the application. We are considering that we, uh, it was a very simple and uh, small execution. Uh, these two lines are not significant uh, from the scientific uh, point of view uh, because here we are uh, calculated just a small fraction of the final result, which is this big uh, feature here. So this guy is not significant. Anyway, what we calculated, this is the real graph of the, the small uh, computation. This is what has been calculated by, executed by POMS. Uh, part of this, the most interesting part is that you can see here there are a lot of dependencies and these are resolved by, by POMS. Uh, some of these uh, balance here tasks are MPI applications that are also completely managed by, by POMS. And uh, oh, there is some error here. And here is the, let's say, the final, the, the real final uh, result. Um, and uh, going back to the, to the slides. So this was a, an introduction to, to POMS, what you can do with POMS. This is our group of the workflow distributed computing team led by, led by Rosa Dalia uh, and Jesus Labarta in the computer science department uh, of, of BSC. Um, so now is time for uh, uh, questions. Uh, you can put questions here in the uh, on your um, webinar uh, control panel. Uh, maybe you can pass the, the presentation to Rosen again. Yes. Thank you, Daniele. We can stay on uh, this slide while we're waiting for questions from the audience. Thanks for the nice discussion. Um, we have a question from Adam, I guess. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, so I was going to go back. Uh, can I go back to the, the slide, the, the Star SS slide that compared um, uh, comps with uh, OMPSS? Yeah, this one. Yep. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more um you may have mentioned but sorry but the audio seemed to break up a little bit just at the point you were talking about it um could you say a little bit more about the difference between the the kind of way that you have to program for ompss and the way that you have to program for pycoms I mean, the comparison uh between the yeah. the memory and the oh, files yeah. objects and the mvms in particular yeah OMS yeah. is um uh, quite similar and also contributes actually to OpenMP. So OpenMP also is a task uh, level programming model and OMS is an implement another implementation which is quite similar and uh, also interoperable with the OpenMP. So here you're working with a, a small in the sense of uh, duration uh, of task inside uh, one node of a supercomputer, for example. So here you are distributing tasks inside one uh, node uh, or across nodes of a supercomputer. While with COMS, we are dealing with a uh, um, uh, task that, uh, first of all, can have a input uh, files, not in memory uh, objects. Okay, so this because we are dealing with an application that doesn't don't work with a in memory objects, but works with the uh, files, with the uh, objects, uh, big uh, objects. And also we have to distribute this uh, computation and this input and output data across nodes of a, of a cluster, of a grid, or whatever. So it's the, it's the size of what we are going to uh, compute. Yeah, uh, so when you talk, yes. So and actually, talk uh, sorry, just to um, highlight the fact that uh, also, we have an implementation of uh, uh, COMS uh, on top of OMS. So you can program an application. This is something which is ongoing in a European project. So you can have a high-level uh, workflow uh, 
described uh, from written with, with forms. And one of the tasks can be a NOMS uh, application. For example, if you may want to run a, a NOMS application that executes on GPUs, for example, it's written in NOMS, but it's a part of a bigger workflow. So still you can use TOMS to orchestrate that part of the, of the execution. Because we, for example, with TOMS, we don't go uh, in the GPUs. We are not able to instantiate threads inside the, uh, a GPU. So in this case, we use uh, OMS. Okay. So the different the difference is the granularity level of the of the code. Yeah. Okay. So that's nice. So so what do you so what do you mean by an object in the case of PyComp? Then do you mean like a uh, here object an object of a of a class, for example, instances of of a class. Okay. So you, you can't. Okay. So it's still an an in memory object, but it's something. Because yeah, but we, for this object, the difference is that we, for example, in the case of comps, when we use remote nodes, we serialize those objects. We send those objects, it's not, not more in memory, let's say, but because are uh, wired to the network and, and execute remotely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I was uh, wondering if if somebody wants to try out comps, uh, do you have any links to like tutorials or some like online material that they can try out yeah. themselves? I don't know if I put in the end. Uh, uh, let me check. Yeah, here actually, if you go to our website, you, you have uh, different things. You can download comps. Um, next, actually, we will release uh, on Monday. Um, uh, for supercomputing, you know, every year we release a new version of COMS for supercomputing. Uh, so we release a new version uh, 2.4 of COMS. So you, you can download the, um, the new Docker image, you can download also the packages for Debian, etc. We have a, a lot of documentation, and uh, in this documentation, you can find a tutorial. And, to, uh, to execute some uh, comps example uh, using uh, both uh, the uh, Docker image or we have also a, a virtual appliance that you can run in with the virtual box. Mm -hmm. So you can follow the instructions of, uh, of the tutorial and um, yeah, you can try on your own comps mm -hmm. application. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I encourage our uh, listeners to check out and uh, try comps. Yeah. Uh, as, as we said, it's one of the platforms that will be working extensively with in future, also in Bar Excel. Uh, so we're we'll looking forward for uh, its application. Um, well, we are already past the hour, so in the interest of time, we should stop here. And with it, I want to thank Daniele again. And uh, Thank you. Can you change to the last, the very last slide? Uh, I want to announce. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, in a few weeks, uh, we have uh, the next uh, webinar from the Bar Excel series. It's uh, on MD Benchmark, which is a suite for doing well benchmarking MD simulations and. Uh, uh, for those of our attendees who are listening to this, I, I would encourage you to check it out. It uh, will be very uh, useful, especially for those of you running Gromox or, or similar MD codes. So, thank you all, and uh, see you next time. Everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.